Welcome past, present, and soon-to-be D&D players to D&D 101, a first-level course. As always, I'm Max Hendricks, and this episode we're going to be talking about the history of Dungeons & Dragons. So let's start it off with he who started it all, Gary Gygax! The... Boo! That was just plain me. Who... Olga, what are you doing here again? <laughs> I figured you might need a co-host to your little TV show. It's a podcast. A what? A podcast. Like a pea pod. Like radio for the internet. Ah. Oh. But I'll take it. Okay. Okay. But Gary Gygax, uh, this dude back in the 70s was like the nerd of nerds. He was like one of those OG LOTR, like Lord of the Rings nerds. He wanted to take the books that he and a bunch of people were reading and create like a game where they could play the adventures that they always read about. So he, he wanted a Lord of the Rings game. Yeah, he wanted to take fantasy and create a way for you to play that. So he took his already existing game, Chainmail, which was like a miniatures war game and use that as the combat system for Dungeons & Dragons, which he created with his company, uh, TSR. Dungeons & Dragons, the first edition anyway, came out in 1974, and back then there were only three classes, Warrior, Wizard, and Cleric, which are fairly similar to what we have today. It's a fighter, a caster, oh, and another caster, I guess. Yeah, but like a holy caster. In addition to the three classes, there are only four races to start off with. Uh, they were fairly similar to the races that you'd find in Lord of the Rings. Human, Dwarf, Elf, and Hobbit, which is now the Halfling. And the game started off very difficult to play unless you had already played Gygax's Chainmail game, which was why in 1975, with the release of the Greyhawk Supplement Adventure, the combat system was entirely changed to no longer be reliant on chainmail, making it so much easier for new players to get into the game. And this theme of changing small aspects of the game to overall improve is how we continued on going into new additions. In 1979, a new version of D&D came out called Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. This was where the game itself was split into two sects, D&D and AD&D. The AD&D became a lot easier to understand. There, you didn't need to comb through books to find all the information anymore. They added new classes, and it became much more popular than the original Dungeons and & Dragons, and eventually became the only version of the game. So you're telling me that the game called Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was actually easier to play, more fun, and more popular than the original edition? Yeah, kind of backwards, isn't it? But AD&D did take the cake in the end. Then in the 80s, this huge craze came along called the Satanic Panic, where people were absolutely freaking out about Satanism and the practice of like Satanic rituals, and that scared a lot of people who were hearing about Dungeons and Dragons with demons. Why? Because a huge part of the game was fighting or working with demons and devils. Mm. Yeah, so in 1989, with the release of AD&D 2, or 2nd edition, demons and devils were entirely removed from the game or given new names altogether. In this new game, things were simplified, rules were more codified, and the template for the ideal party, I love this one, was based on a 1980 sitcom. Can you guess it? Uh... I can't name any 80s sitcoms. That's fair. You weren't, you didn't exist back then. It was the Golden Girls. Wow. You know, Rose and. No. I am a D&D &D character. Blanche. I, get me a Hulu subscription and maybe, maybe I can catch up. <laughs> and then in 1995, AD&D took over entirely. Dungeons and Dragons as we knew it was completely phased out completely out of production, and AD&D, which was far more popular, became the only version of it. To explain a little bit about Second Ed, we're going to go ahead and jump over to the party. Wait, wait, we played in Second Ed? Yeah, remember that door that you guys found in the cave? 
so the party has returned to um, the Luminous Cavern to reach a hidden dungeon underneath. As you are walking down this familiar cavern, you see the water that sort of travels its way down the center of the cavern. And uh, you go past where you all had defeated the Hobgoblin previously. And uh, this water continues all the way down this cave, maybe for like a mile or so, until you reach this enormous lion head just carved out of stone. Um, and uh, there are two stone doors that are slightly ajar in where its mouth would be, and the water runs underneath them. Um, so it's big, 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 big lion head. Big lion head. Like um, like Aladdin type. Like the mouth is the door. I know yeah. you were imagining Aladdin when you wrote this. I can see it in your eyes. I want to go through the doors. Okay. There are two of them. Well, hang on. I want to peek through the the little, you know, they're like slightly ajar, right? Mm -hmm. I want to see if I can see anything through the opening. Um, you look past the doors, and do you have dark vision? God, where does it say that? It's under, um... What am I? It's like, Features. Um, oh, yeah. I, ha okay. I, I have dark vision, yes. Okay, great. Or, as it's known in 2E, infra vision. Yeah, that is, that's an intuitive thing. Yeah. To call it. You look down this path, and... Inside of it, it's entirely dark. You see it in a dim light, but mm -hmm. you see the water continue down this carved out square hallway. Me. Like for the full 60 feet that you can see in the dark. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Seems fine to me. All right. Do you want to peek in the other door, bud? Is not what I say. No, no they're, they're the same. At least the it's same. Like, like double doors. It's double doors. Ah. Yes. So it's like. It's just a crevice between the two ah, doors. Ah, okay. I, I, I um, take charge and I ask the group, so should we go in? Yeah, it seems fine. Zira? We've survived this long. I say we go for it. All right, okay. Um, Aga's gonna slam the doors open in a very... Okay, I'm gonna need you to roll a, D a D100. D100. <laughs> That's a 22. Uh... <laughs> Well, you have a 30% chance of, you know, getting it. So you are within that percentage. You slam it open with your incredible might. Strength is different from everything else, basically. Strength is very odd in okay. this one, especially when it comes to like opening doors. So it's like a whole <laughs> yeah. mechanic. But, like, if you have... I can't make it too easy for him. <laughs> no, basically, if you have a certain strength, uh -huh. like whatever your ability score is, you can open a certain number of doors, and depending on what your strength is, it is likelier that you will be able to open a like a heavier thing. I'm sorry, you guys. I can't open this door. I run out of mana. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I something that I look for in games is how deep the door opening system is. Um. So twenty two percent. Yeah. You you 22. you slam open the doors, and they crash into the stone wall behind them. Whoa. Okay. And you, it is open. All right, and I, and I walk in very like swaggery, like confident, like a like a frat boy who's just walked back on his turf. Oh, gross! That's perfect. <laughs> Do you guys follow? Um, yeah. I'm gonna peek through the door. Jeez, that was hard. It should have been called Advanced Doors and Doors. Yeah. Well, doors got easier to deal with in third edition. In 2003, 3rd edition came out. The advanced part of the name was dropped entirely, and AD&D simply became Dungeons & Dragons. In this edition, the D20 system, which we currently use, was introduced to the game. It simplified the game to resolve all actions by rolling a D20, the 20-sided die, and adding a relevant skill modifier, like we talked about last episode. What were they doing before? You know, I actually don't know what they used before the D20 system. Let's find out. Sure, I'll check out the wiki. Mm. Into the internet we go. All right. I sang a licensed musical. Did you really? Shh. I think I sang Into the Woods. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. So what does it say? Uh, Ryan Dancy believed that the strength of Dungeons & Dragons was its gaming community instead of the system. That's blah, not blah, it. Blah. No. Um... Okay, there's something here. So, to 
pass an ability check, you had to roll lower than your ability score, but to hit something or succeed on a saving throw, you had to roll higher than your ability score. That's weird. Yeah. That's very convoluted. It is. I'm glad we changed it. And then in 2003, 3.5e, as we call it, came out. It was a between edition that made small changes to address complaints made by fans. The entire game is almost entirely compatible with third edition with small changes like adding character features or spells or classes. But then in 2008, Gary Gygax, the creator of Dungeons and Dragons, passed away from heart complications. <laughs> it's okay, Hog. It's okay. <coughs> it's gonna be okay. <laughs> it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. But despite Gary Gygax's death, 4th edition came out that same year. During the pre-order period for the game, it entirely sold out stock. Are you okay? Okay. Here, have a tissue. Blow your nose. <laughs> you can keep this. <clears throat> Unlike previous editions, 4th Ed actually updated their core rule books every single year and released new versions of it. Basically, to stay up, you had to buy the new books or else you were out of the game entirely. They removed and added new classes, as well as adding a more in-depth combat system and a power system that each class relied on. Everyone basically had superpowers in this game. What? Not like actual superpowers, but you had like daily abilities. Sort of like how you have features in in 5th edition. So I can only stab once a day. It's not so much the stabbing, it's like you're special stabbed. My, uh, my halberd? My most preciousest gem of a weapon. Sure, your halberd. My halberd. To sort of explain how the combat system in 4E works, we're gonna go ahead and jump back into the party. I think they're dealing with some bandits this time. It was a rough day. And suddenly, uh, you hear a <gasps> And there's a horn that goes off uh, slightly up the it. path. So you all are uh, continuing up the path and you get noticed. Uh, suddenly, uh, an arrow shoots out at the both of you. On Frumpus 12, it hits you. Yeah. Yeah. Aga, your armor class, does a 16 hit you? My armor class is 16. So yes, it does. Aww. Your Nike armor. <laughs> My Nike armor, right in the swoosh. <laughs> right in the swoosh. Okay, so you both take, uh, you you take one point of damage and you take two. Ow. Ah. That's the sound that I make when Sorry. I get hit by an arrow. <laughs> from... <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you got a paper cut yeah. except in your oh, chest. Dang. Oh, so, my yeah. Jordans. <laughs> <laughs> right in the Jordans. <laughs> you fail your stealth mm -hmm. and a ranger from these bandits is shooting at you and then you hear a bunch of them go, what's that over there? Get him! And then from way back you hear, get him, man. All right. And then a bunch of humans start running out. I need you all to roll initiative. All right. Even me? Well, you're still in the battle. You're just unnoticed. She doesn't have to be. Oh, okay. You're unnoticed, but in battle. It be a nine. That's a 16. I got a 15. How many boys? A few boys. Okay. Up first is the bandits. Out of this patch of like loose, like tree branches or whatever, come running five guys, five humans with like short swords. Do they have fries? Are they all dudes? <laughs> there's five, five guys. There's five guys. <laughs> <laughs> guys, there's a five guys out here. Basically, they act as a group. They're all going to go separately, but like I'm just having them in the same initiative. Okay. There were three bandits earlier. I lied. Operation Kill Aga begins now. With one okay. kill swoop. So Aga, you are attacked. I am the biggest target. Does an 18 hit? Oh, yeah. One of them is going to come out with a shield and slam you, basically trying to take you off your guard. That's going to be four damage. All right. So then 
The second one is going to try and attack Frumpus. Does a 15 hit you? Yeah. Okay. And does three damage. Ow. I'm almost dead. Don't die, Frumpy. I'm trying. I don't know why. But this is my, this is Frumpus's inner monologue. The last bandit tries to attack Aga and you sort of dodge out of the way. Up next is their boss who from behind them, you see this seven foot tall man that's very ripped with like a mallet run out. And he's just like, oh yeah. Before you did that voice, I was going to be like, is it Terry Crews? It's the Kool-Aid man. His skin is slightly red. And he takes his entire turn to basically get up to you guys and crossing the camp. We actually had to cut down the fight a little bit for this episode, but the length and the complexity of combat in 4th edition is what caused a lot of people to end up leaving the game for a while. And after they left 4th edition, they ended up moving all over to Pathfinder, a game that was released in 2009 by Paizo Publishing, a company that previously worked with Dungeons & Dragons to print their books back in 3rd edition. Ooh, Rival comes back! Pathfinder was a lot more similar to 3.5e than it was to 4e, which is why a lot of fans, after 3.5e was no longer supported by Dungeons & Dragons, ended up leaving Dungeons & Dragons to go play Pathfinder. It was a lot more rules-heavy in areas that weren't just combat, which a lot of people liked. Not only was it very commercial, because you had to keep buying the books to be able to play the game, Mm -hmm. but it was also so complicated in one very specific aspect of the game that it isolated a lot of players. That's exactly right. It was very difficult for a lot of people to get into it because of that. Which is why in 2012, when the makers of Dungeons & Dragons announced a new edition, a lot of people were skeptical. But along with this, the creators released a playtest version of the game for the next two years before the release date of the official game so that they could make sure that the game was right before they released it. This introduced new mechanics to simplify and streamline the game. As much as you can simplify a nine-hour game. That's fair. Eleven-hour game. I did play a 12-hour game of Dungeons & Dragons once. What? It was really fun. We streamed it. That's like half my lifespan. Holy. Baga, you're like a baby. Mm Mm-hmm. But since you're from 5e, you're going to feel really familiar with this one. Actions in and out of combat became more reliant on your ability scores, so the D20 system was brought more into play. There was the addition of advantages and disadvantages, where you roll 2D20 and then take the higher or lower number, and they replaced the power system with traditional class race features to once again simplify the game. In the end, 5th E was all about having fun, whether it's about your combat, about your roleplay, or whatever. Even the creators of the game, like I've said before, encourage you to change the rules if it makes it better for you. Just have fun, whether you're playing 2nd Ed, AD&D, 3.5e, Pathfinder, 4e, 5e. No matter what it is, just have fun. That's the real important part about D&D, and that's what the history of the game has taught us. It wasn't about the treasure. It was about the journey and the friendships we made along the way. Cue harmonica music. We could play real harmonica music, you realize. Yeah. If you'd like to hear more from the party, we'll be releasing the full audio of their adventures throughout the summer. Thank you for listening, and a special thank you to Jan Morgenstern, for the use of our theme song, Circling Dragons. I'm Max Hendricks. The voice of Zira is Marisa Whitcomb. The voice of Frumpus is Paul Winch. And the voice of Aga is Rita Welch. Thank you. And as always... I just looked up the Golden Girls, and they have a cruise line, guys! Who wants to go on a boat adventure?